Okay, so uh, what is that? Uh, I think it's about 2.45. It's the afternoon session, so thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jaya Matthew. I'm a data scientist with Microsoft, and uh, we've been working on a bunch of different customer use cases, primarily external customers, and based on my experience, I kind of thought that I'll actually uh, give a short talk on how to quickly add multi-language support to any of our AI applications. So let's first quickly look at the agenda. So I kind of thought that before we get into how it gets done, it might be useful to just have one slide kind of introducing the topic of machine translation. Why do we need it? A little short description of the evolution and applications, and then we'll focus on neural machine translation. So that's where most of the work and research is happening right now. To kind of piece all this together, I kind of thought that it'll be useful to show a sample use case which shows you how speech from one language gets translated to speech in a different language and how all the different APIs can be kind of pieced together to do this end-to-end -end process. I have some useful links towards the end. So, I mean, some of the things, uh, some lecture videos, some papers, some of the Microsoft tools, documentation. So I think it's kind of nice to leave the audience with something in case they are interested. Uh, I hope to have a couple of minutes towards the end for questions and answers. Otherwise, I'll be in the room in case there are any questions. Okay, so now let's get started with what is machine translation? So pretty much most of us have used either Google Translate or Bing Translate. So that's one of the classic use cases of machine translation. So essentially, here's a screenshot where I kind of type out this little word, hello, and I'm, it auto detects hello as being English. And then I'm interested in trying to figure out how to say this in Hindi. So then it kind of gives me the Hindi Devangari script as well as the transliterated where it kind of tells the native user how do you actually say it, although I cannot speak the language. So now, so this is what machine translation is actually doing. It's actually the task of automatically converting text from one source language to a target language. So now, why do we really need it? So if you kind of look at the current landscape, most of the content that gets generated is in a single language. And so now if you want to cater to an audience which is much larger than just one language, you would need to somehow translate it from one language to another. So now, trying to do this manually is extremely costly. So if you think of all, this is primarily to augment human productivity. So you can't have a bunch of humans, uh, you know, kind of convert every single tweet or Facebook post from one language to another. Somehow the machine just has to do it. It's more scalable and it actually even drops down the cost. But the performance of machine translation systems are still to reach human parity. You know? So, I mean, there are some issues, but at least it does it at a much rapid clip. Okay, so now let's quickly look at the evolution. So it, it, it's kind of interesting to just uh, look at this slide to kind of understand how it's evolved over the years. So in terms of machine translation, the first wave was something known as rule-based machine translation, known as RBMT, where you know this bunch of expert linguists who understood languages came up with a bunch of rules and said, this is how you would translate from one language to another. This is kind of cumbersome. It takes a lot of work and effort to have all these linguists, experts in the language, kind of tell you how to translate from one language to another. Then came the next wave, which was the statistical machine translation, SMT in short, where uh, you're trying to translate a text from one language to another, given a huge bunch of examples. So you have parallel data sets, essentially. So maybe it's data in English and data in Hindi, and you're actually telling the statistical model to kind of build you know, some sort of rules on its own, as opposed to have a linguist do it. So then you have you know, word-based, syntax-based, and phrase-based models. So again, this was effective at that point in the 1990s, but then the performance of these SMT models started to plateau off. And that's when a bunch of work, especially by Google and other companies, uh, came in the domain of neural machine translation. So that's when, uh, what is a computing became cheaper, then it was easier to run all these deep learning models like RNN LSTMs, and then it was just easier to have one huge neural network do the entire translation from you know, source to target. 
So now over the next couple of slides, we'll just quickly look at what statistical machine translation is. I think I mentioned pretty much that it's either word-based, phrase-based, syntax-based translation, and there's a bit of alignment that needs to be done because many a times each of the words don't map to a single word. It might map to multiple words or uh, in a different language. Now, let's look at what a neural machine translation is. So here's, like I said, an end-to-end. -end, you're trying to just model the entire process. So just give it the data. So this is one big artificial neural network, typically an end-to-end -end encoder, decoder. And it has a bunch of different either RNN, GN, GRUs, or LSTMs. OK, so now. Okay, so before we actually get into neural machine translation, which is the focus of this talk, I kind of thought that uh, in addition to uh, the Bing Translate example, I'd actually just outline a few more uh, examples. So here is, so these are some of the APIs that are readily available, so we don't have to go and reinvent the wheel to try and, uh, you know, do translation from one language to another. So we have APIs which automatically detects what the input language is and can actually, using the API, translate it to one language. Or you can use an API to translate one of the words or a sentence from one language to multiple languages. Or you can actually do transliteration, which is where you have language in, let's say, English, and you're interested in trying to convert it into Chinese, but you don't know how to speak Chinese. So then it has a transliterated uh, script, which kind of enables the user to kind of say it. Or you can also uh, you, you know, use it as a bilingual dictionary, where you have examples of human translated sentences and synonyms for some of the words. So these are some of the few applications that we support. I'm sure there are many others, but this is a few of them. So now let's get into what is neural machine translation, because that's what we use, and I think most of the uh, companies actually use this right now. So essentially, to kind of understand this, so this is just an overview slide. We'll get into a deep dive on the next slide. But in this one, we essentially look at neural machine translation as just essentially two steps. So the first step is something called encoding. And the second is something called decoding. So in the encoding phase, each of the, uh, the model kind of models each word based on context within the full sentence. So that's the encoding. So it creates this huge vector. And then the decoding phase essentially takes that vector and translates it word by word within the context into that destination target language. So now this looks quite simple, but in reality it's not as simple. So we'll actually look at how it looks in real life. So here is, so let's assume we have an English sentence that I'm interested in translating into French or Italian or anything, any, any of the languages. So the first layer is where you know, each of the model is modeled in context. So assume that in this step, you have a neural net, which creates a 500-dimensional uh, you know, vector for each of the words. So this is the first word. Then it actually, uh, what is that, creates a 1,000-dimensional uh, vector model to kind of also capture the context of the word. So this gets done for each of the words in that sentence. OK, so this is a. Not very long a sentence, but let's say about 10 words in the sentence. So then what you kind of do is you actually repeat this process. And it's not essentially just one encoder, one decoder. It's kind of nested. So you repeat this process many times. You have many layers so that you kind of get the context in a much better fashion. And you come up with this final input matrix. So this is actually the input matrix that gets into your decoder step. But if you simply have a encoder and decoder, what happens is in very long sentences, it is unable to find the context and forgets uh, some of the information about the past. So typically, nowadays, this attention algorithm is something that is quite popular, where you know an attention layer is put between the encoder and the decoder, and it kind of has some sort of memory as to what happened in the past. Okay. So then this attention layer information, uh, along with that final input matrix, gets into your decoder layer. So compared to the previous slide, this looks way more messy in terms of how many layers it has and everything. So now this decoder layer essentially translates the neural net that 
thousand dimensional, uses the attention algorithm, and starts translating each word one at a time based on context. So this is uh, how the entire NMT actually works. Okay, so now I kind of alluded to why we don't simply have just an encoder decoder in the previous slide. So essentially, if you think of just using a vanilla sequence to sequence, and especially when it comes to very long sentences, typically greater than 30 words, they, it tends to have very poor results just because of the fixed dimensionality of the decoder. So that's where, like I said, the attention layer comes in and it actually helps somehow influence the past onto the future prediction of the word. So then the next question is, okay, I have this attention thing. Now, uh, which part of the vector should I focus on? So, you know, you kind of build a context vector with some sort of weighted average to do that. So this is just some of the issues. I think there are some other issues, but I just picked on two of them. So then, um, so to kind of also, uh, you know, wrap up this NMT piece is, why is uh, neural machine translation much more popular than statistical machine translation or rule-based machine translation? So here is, this is just so much simpler. It's just an end-to-end -end training. All the parameters are simultaneously optimized to minimize the loss of the entire network. So it's a one step. You don't have to maintain multiple little models and stuff. Then there's distributed representations. So there's sharing of word and phrase similarities and you know, better exploitation of context of that word in a sentence. As well as it's, it ends up being, um, you know, it's more fluent text generation. So uh, it's kind of shown quite good results of late, so we also tend to use it most of the time now. So now to kind of actually show how this works in terms of a speech translation use case. So here, what is a speech translation uh, tool? So essentially, you have a client app that captures some amount of voice or something, and then that uh, audio file is sent to some web API, and then the web API does something, and it actually sends out the translated text. It can send it out as either text or even voice. Okay, so now we'll get into how this actually works. So here's where the audio comes in first. So the first thing that happens in an end-to-end -end tool that you want to do is use something called an automatic speech recognition tool. So that's where you know, the speech gets translated into. It assumes that the speech has something like, can, can you hear me? So most of the times when we humans talk, there are pauses, and then sometimes we repeat words, and uh, sometimes uh, you know, we say the wrong, incorrect word, and it's, it's difficult for the tool to automatically recognize. So we would need to clean this up, because in this case, maybe by mistake I said, can, can you hear me? And then, so it's captured everything, so it needs to remove the duplicate words. And then here is like, I mean, there is H-E-R-E, there's H-E-A-R, it needs to look at the context and kind of decide uh, which one actually makes sense. So we have something called a true text piece, which kind of helps correct this text that was captured. So what it first does it, okay, it kind of sees that there are two duplicate words, remove that. Then it, it looks at it again, and in the context it's like, well, H-E-R-E doesn't kind of make sense in here, let's correct it to hear me. Okay, so it finally corrects the whole thing into can you hear me, which, is, which makes more sense in this context. So now, that the transcript is ready, we will send it for machine translation. So this is what happens, and it gets into machine translation. In this case, we're trying to translate text from English to Chinese. So uh, the translator API just uh, uses NMT and does the translation. And finally, you can use the text to speech to kind of translate this text into speech in Chinese and give it to the customer. Okay, so this is how we would actually piece all the different APIs that we have. And we don't have to think about building the model. We can always customize it because we have options to do that. So if you look at this, during the entire process, partial transcripts, final transcripts, as well as translations are available in case we need to use it for something else, training some other data, uh, you know, model or anything. So right now I think, uh, I mean, the number of languages supported uh, are this, but it just keeps changing. I mean, they do increase the scope of different languages and language support. Okay, so now 
what happens is many a times I don't want to use the API as it is because it does not fit the industry, the context that I'm trying to do. So that's where I want some sort of customization in here. So we have support for custom speech, custom translator, and custom voice. So in this case, you know, if we have our own data, we can bring it in and actually just build over the pre-trained models. So we don't have to do all the heavy weight of building the model from scratch. We have something that works using all the data that we have, and then we just bring in our additional thing. So in here, so, you know, I mean, if you're looking at specific IT-related terminology, maybe a general model doesn't have all that in there. So that's when, you know, and uh, you might want to build over one of these generic models. And then training a model from scratch is complex, expensive, and most of the companies don't want to go through that whole process. So that's why we actually would recommend using Custom Translator. So the way we kind of evaluate this is if you look at the blue scores, a generic model on any sort of data would give you a blue score of roughly 20 to 30. A human is, per, you know, must, is, is one of the best sitting in here between 50 and 75. I mean, but if you kind of uh, give some additional industry-specific data, you can actually bump up the blue scores. Not as perfect as a human, but it's right in between, like 30, 45, depending on your data. Okay, so now this is here. Here's where you're trying to uh, translate a sentence, I think, from French to English, and this is using your generic model. So now, I mean, if you look at the, if you read the text, it doesn't really make too much sense. So what you do is, you essentially try and build a custom model. This is just a very simple four-step process where you first upload the data. So you have to have a parallel corpus of data, whatever the language is, if it's Hindi, English, French, English, whatever. So essentially you have two files, which could be text and there are various formats that we support, and you uh, need to give this data, you upload it into the system for training. So once this data is uploaded, you train using this data to build a custom model. Okay. And then you can test it with either new data or if you have withheld some other data and didn't use it for training, you can do that. And finally, you essentially just well, have a little. So it kind of says that with this little bit of data, there's a little bit of improvement compared to the general model. So if you give it more data, more pertinent data, it does improve quite a bit. And then you kind of deploy it, and if you kind of compare this with the previous one, let's see, it ends up correcting the English sentence slightly better. So that's the whole aim of actually customizing what you have with your data. So it actually takes away all the complexity of trying to build any of the NMT models from scratch, and you're able to leverage some of the work that is already done, use the APIs, do a little bit of tweaking, and it's just so quick to actually do it for any of your applications. Okay. Now, to, yeah, yeah, so uh, I, I kind of think I have a couple of minutes left, and that's kind of perfect. So I actually wanted to leave everyone with a few links. So the first two were kind of really interesting blogs. Then I kind of thought that it's interesting to read about LSTMs, neural, uh, you know, RNNs, then that's the paper with attention models that is good to read, and that's what I got the information from. And the last link is actually a Stanford lecture series on NLP. It's, it's a series of 18 to 19 videos, about one or 20 minutes each, and it's really worth looking at that. So then, you know, the last is some, uh, you know, information about our translator tool, and yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much what I had. So. If there are any questions, I'm here. I think I'm almost out of time, but I'll be here if anyone has any questions. So actually, so you, uh, so if you have a lot of data that is patent-related data, and you have some sample, 
you know, in your destination target language, if you train it in the custom model, it should be able to do it. You need the parallel corpus. So, to English or whatever language. Yeah, so I think I think the initial step for even some of the things that we do, we actually need to hire people to manually translate it and then give in some sample data. Because without that, so, but I, but I think the requirement for how much data is needed is just about 10,000 sentences in. So, so I'm actually thinking if you just have about 10,000 sentences of that patent translated into a different language, you can actually feed it in this, upload it and see if it actually works. We've seen quite a bit of success even with just 10,000 sentences. So I mean, yeah, it, it, the first step is hard to get the data in, in the format is expensive. So it has to be done manually? Yes, yes. Yeah, and I think even initially when they started off with some of the tools that we have, we actually hired people to do the translation into languages because without that, we don't have the training data. So. Uh, I had a question here. Ooh. Yeah, uh, uh, regarding the attention uh, layer of the model, uh, uh, could you clarify when, when you say it's learning from the past, mm -hmm. which means it's, it's got already data of, uh, in the, in the, in the la target language already stored? I mean, what is the, uh, that no, layer no. doing? No, so no. It's, uh, so it's, it actually has some information about the source language. Okay. So the source sentence, so if it is, this is my name, something, so then that attention layer kind of remembers the very first few words. Because otherwise it doesn't remember the first few words, loses the context, and only looks at the immediate previous word and makes mistakes. So it's, a, it so it's a source language, not the It is a language. source language. Okay, thanks. <laughs>